we start off the next set of work here, intro GIS module, module four, we're starting to work into creating data. And we're also starting to work a lot more with the underlying databases of spatial data, of vector data, the attribute table, but also connecting it with other non-spatial data, making that other data spatial. So this outlay is really just about managing those connections between our spatial and our non-spatial data set. And then that leads you into the fourth lab, which is the really big creating data lab. And I hope over time to, to fill out the rest of this playlist with your questions and thoughts that you have uh, as we're beginning our spatial data adventure here. So keep those coming. Emails, YouTube comments, however you want to put those. Love to expand this more and more as we go. But talking about databases, we're talking about joining. Then you roll into lab four, you get a deal with all the fun there creating data. Now, Really, anytime you're using GIS, you're working with a database. Sounds a little scary when you think about it. Now, sometimes this is explicitly in something called a geo database, but those are a little bit more complex. We, we don't always use those from the get-go. So in an introductory GIS course, the, the strategies sometimes are give learners a geo database. Everything is perfectly set up. Let them do the work there. Or let's give the basics, let's just give shape files, that way it doesn't get too confusing. I work with that second setup, but wherever you are in your GIS learning experience, you may have seen a geo database. That's just a database that has geospatial or spatial attributes. I think a shape file is just a geo or a geo database too. Well, see, this is where it gets tricky breaking down the different components. A shape file is not a geo database because a geodatabase would call it a feature class. So a shapefile is its own kind of database, that's for sure, because it contains attribute information structured in a certain way. There we go, clarify that. Now, in this kind of very open concept of databases, Excel, Sheets, probably a database too, CSV, they also have structures and formats. So we've been working with databases and ideas so far in this course in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that we did in lab three, we touched on a little bit that needs a little bit more detail for, is this idea of the join. The join is an operation that links two tables relationally using a key value common to each. Relational databases are databases which are structured to be able to relate or link to each other. So relational databases have the capacity to link one set of information to another set of information simply through a relatable value or a relatable column, or relatable information. This key value is our linkable value. And the key means that the values are shared and are consistent between tables. And therefore, we can relate or link them together confidently. Item one, item two, item three, all have the same key value, whatever it might be, in one table as the items in this other table, and then we can relate them together. The key value might not be the unique identifier, the thing that tells us what the unique aspects of the given parts of our data are, but that's okay. As long as we can relate our information together, we're in business. Let's take a look at this spreadsheet. We have a list of presidents, U.S. presidents, George Washington, notable email fan. And we have a bunch of information about them. Customer ID, first name, last name, email address, city, state, and zip code. If we're looking at this table, we, want, we might want to think about what is the unique identifier that allows us to 
uniquely identify these different precedents. Well, some things we can see are shared. We can't use them. Zip code, city, state. Address might be unique, but we don't know that for sure. Certainly, we've had uh, multiple Adams, multiple Bushes as president. They could have shared an address at some point. Email might be unique. We haven't reused any emails. Last name, no. First name, no. Customer ID. In this case, I would uniquely identify our presidents using their customer ID, their number. When you are the first president, your ID one. When you're the second president, ID two, so on and so on and so on. So this allows us to uniquely understand who we are referencing when we talk about presidents. Email might work. Kind of depends on if the email schema is uh, predictable or if it changes over time. Customer ID is obviously a lot more reliable as a unique identifier because it just goes one, two, three, so on. But we could use email as a key value if we had, say, a list of presidential email something that we needed to link to. Who's this James Madison guy anyway? Tell me his address. This idea of linking records, linking entries between different tables, between different components is basically universal across everything that we do that requires some kind of database. In this case, we have a passenger table, name, social security number, and flight number. We have a flight table, flight number, start and end. Our unique identifiers in these tables, the things that allow us to uniquely identify who these people are, well, in the passenger table, that's SSN, that's social security number. No one shares a social security number with anyone else. Everyone gets a unique one. Name could certainly be shared. Obviously, flight number is shared. So in our passenger table, our unique identifier is our social security number. But our key value, the value that we're going to do a join on, is not social security number. Because we're not storing that in every table. That would be bad design. Deeply personal information in every aspect of your uh, database design is a bad idea. But of course, this is somehow how databases get hacked, how your identity gets stolen, all that kind of stuff. Please note these social security numbers are fake, just to clarify. If we look at our flight table though, flight number, that is a unique identifier in the flight table. In the flight table, we can't have shared flights. Flight 101, flight 313, flight 123, so on and so on and so on. Each flight number represents a specific route. It could represent specific timelines. It could represent specific airlines. It could do anything. So our flight number here gives us this capability to uniquely identify flights in the flight table, but it also serves in this join that we're doing as the key value. It allows us to link and tell us where is Alice ending her flight. Where is Carol headed for their vacation? Where does Bob 222 start his adventure? You can find that when you link these tables. It is not just in the passenger table, and the passengers are not in the flight table, but when you join them, when you create that linkage, you get that information together. And that's one of the things that spatial, not even spatial databases, databases, relational databases allow us to do. Pick a key value, link them, create a new table. In some cases, this table might be exported as a new spreadsheet. Maybe it's just temporary and then it goes into the void after this. Great, we can remake it if we need to. This is from our lab three data, our lovely bears. We had an FID, a shape, and a zone name. 
of our bare zones. That's our shape file. That's our attribute table hanging out right there. Then we had an Excel file, a, no, a CSV that we looked at in Excel that has zone name and count. If we want to get the count with these bears here, we need to join them. We need to relate these tables on the zone name. We can link these, and then you can tell me how many bears are in the Bitterroot Mountains zone. Zone name becomes our key value versus our unique identifier of the FID in the attribute table. We do the same thing with student records. If you're an enrolled student at UMass or someplace else, you likely have a student ID number. That is the key to getting everything figured out in terms of course enrollments, in terms of uh, advisors and majors, all that kind of stuff. If we link our results here using ID and student ID, excuse me, we can see that Bob's advisor is Dr. Who. Pretty straightforward. We would store these in different places for privacy reasons, for student information concerns, so on and so on. That number then becomes an anonymizing factor. Works here. Here are some football results. You could link the match ID with team names, with coach names, with goal scorers, so on and so on and so on. Our key value varies depending on what we're trying to link. Well, if we're trying to link goal, the goal table with the e-team table so that we can figure out who is the coach of Robert Lewandowski, well, then I'm gonna use team ID and ID to link those. Those are my keys. But if I want to know where uh, Fernando Santos played uh, the match where he was the away team, Team 2, then I would link ID to Team 2, ID from E-Team to Team 2 in game, and I could see that that was in the National Stadium in Warsaw. Get the idea? All of these are relatable. All of these are linkable. You can put all of this together to build out a big table, which you could then carve down to just what you need to carve down different pieces to bring in different components together. Our joins, our linkages, are our connection from data that we have spatially to data that might not be explicitly spatial, but that we can still link. And all we need is that key value so that we can link those pieces of information together. Oh, by the way, we're doing all of this spatially as well. This is what gives us the capacity to make all these maps to create all these different pieces. You might have noticed a link on that previous slide to a little site called SQL Zoo. You'll see more about that in the course Moodle if you're enrolled. Otherwise, just head to it. It's a great link. Lots of great practices for doing joins and relationships and stuff like that. Send in your questions. Let me know what thoughts you have. See you when you start creating some data in Lab 4.